Chapter 7. A Fit Tenant for a Haunted House Gilead was a man of dreams, hence his daring, hence also his timidity. He had ideas on many things which were peculiarly his own. There was in his character, perhaps, something of the visionary and the transcendentalist. Hallucinations may haunt the poor peasant like Martin, no less than the king like Henry the Fourth. There are times when the unknown reveals itself in a mysterious way to the spirit of man. A sudden rent in the veil of darkness will make manifest things hitherto unseen, and then close again upon the mysteries within. Such visions have occasionally the power to effect a transfiguration in those whom they visit. They convert a poor camel-driver into a Mahomet, a peasant girl tending her coats into a Joan of Arc. Solitude generates a certain amount of sublime exaltation. It is like the smoke, arising from the burning bush. A mysterious lucidity of mind results, which converts the student into a seer, and the poet into a prophet. Herein we find a key to the mysteries of Horeb, Kedron, Ombos, to the intoxication of Castilian laurels, the revelations of the month Bucion. Hence, too, we have Pelea at Dodona, Femino at Delphos, Trophonius in Lebedea, Ezekiel on the Chabar, and Jerome in the Thetaim. More frequently, this visionary state overwhelms and stupefies its victim. There is such a thing as the divine besottedness. The Hindu fakir bears about with him the burden of his vision, as the cretin his goiter. Luther holding converse with devils in his garret at Wittenberg, Pascal shutting out the view of the infernal regions with the screen of his cabinet, the African obi conversing with the white-faced god Bossum, are each and all the same phenomenon, diversely interpreted by the minds in which they manifest themselves according to their capacity and power. Luther and Pascal were grand, and are grand still. The Obi is simply a poor, half-witted creature. Gilead was neither so exalted nor so low. He was a dreamer, nothing more. Nature presented itself to him under a somewhat strange aspect. Just as he had often found in the perfectly limpid water of the sea strange creatures of considerable size and of various shapes, of the Medusa genus, of the Medusa genus, which out of the water bore a resemblance to soft crystal, and which, cast again into the sea, became lost to sight in that medium by reason of their identity in transparency and colour, so he imagined that other transparencies, similar to these almost invisible denizens of the ocean, might probably inhabit the air around us. The birds are scarcely inhabitants of the air, but rather amphibious creatures passing much of their lives upon the earth. Gilead could not believe the air a mere desert. He used to say, Since the water is filled with life, why not the atmosphere? Creatures colourless and transparent like the air would escape from our observation. What proof have we that there are no such creatures? Analogy indicates that the liquid fields of air must have their swimming habitants, even as the waters of the deep. These aerial fish would, of course, be diaphanous, a provision of their wise creator for our sakes as well as their own. Allowing the light to pass through their forms, casting no shadow, having no defined outline, they would necessarily remain unknown to us and beyond the grasp of human sense. Gilead indulged the wild fancy that if it were possible to exhaust the earth of its atmosphere, or if we could fish the air as we fish the depths of the sea, we should discover the existence of a multitude of strange animals. And then, he would add in his reverie, many things would be made clear. Reverie, which is thought in its nebulous state, borders closely upon the land of sleep, by which it is bounded as by a natural frontier. The discovery of a new world, in the form of an atmosphere filled with transparent creatures, would be the beginning of a knowledge of the vast unknown but beyond opens up the illimitable domain of the possible, teeming with yet other beings, and characterized by other phenomena. 
all this would be nothing supernatural, but merely the occult continuation of the infinite variety of creation. In the midst of that laborious idleness, which was the chief feature in his existence, Gilead was singularly observant. He even carried his observations into the domain of sleep. Sleep has a close relation with the possible, which we call also the invraisemblable. The world of sleep has an existence of its own. Night-time, regarded as a separate sphere of creation, is a universe in itself. The material nature of man, upon which philosophers tell us that a column of air forty-five miles in height continually presses, is wearied out at night, sinks into lassitude, lies down, and finds repose. The eyes of the flesh are closed, but in that drooping head, less inactive than is supposed, other eyes are opened. The unknown reveals itself. The shadow existences of the invisible world become more akin to man, whether it be that there is a real communication, or whether things far off in the unfathomable abyss are mysteriously brought nearer, it seems as if the impalpable creatures inhabiting space come then to contemplate our natures, curious to comprehend the denizens of the earth. Some phantom creation ascends or descends to walk beside us in the dim twilight, some existence altogether different from our own, composed partly of human consciousness, partly of something else, quits his fellows and returns again, after presenting himself for a moment to our inward sight. And the sleeper, not wholly slumbering, not yet entirely conscious, beholds around him strange manifestations of life. Pale spectres, terrible or smiling, dismal phantoms, uncouth masks, unknown faces, hydra-headed monsters, undefined shapes, reflections of moonlight where there is no moon, vague fragments of monstrous forms. All these things which come and go in the troubled atmosphere of sleep, and to which men give the name of dreams, are, in truth, only realities, invisible to those who walk about the daylight world. The dream world is the aquarium of night. So at least thought Gilead. Chapter 8. The Guildholm Ur-Seat the curious visitor in these days would seek in vain in the little bay of Umet for the house in which Gilead lived, or for his garden, or the creek in which he sheltered the Dutch sloop. The Bou de la Rue no longer exists. Even the little peninsula on which his house stood has vanished, levelled by the pickaxe of the quarrymen, and carried away, cartload by cartload, by dealers in rock and granite. It must be sought now in the churches, the palaces, and the keys of a great city. All that ridge of rocks has been long ago conveyed to London. These long lines of broken cliffs in the sea, with their frequent gaps and crevices, are like miniature chains of mountains. They strike the eye with the impression which a giant may be supposed to have in contemplating the Cordilleras. In the language of the country, they are called bonks. These bonks vary considerably in form. Some resemble a long spine, of which each rock forms one of the vertebrae. Some are like the backbone of a fish, while some bear an odd resemblance to a crocodile in the act of drinking. At the extremity of the ridge on which the Boodle Aru was situate was a large rock, which the fishing people of Umet called the Beast's Horn. This rock, a sort of pyramid, resembled, though less in height, the pinnacle of Jersey. At high water the sea divided it from the ridge, and the horn stood alone. At low water it was approached by an isthmus of rocks. The remarkable feature of this beast's horn was a sort of natural seat on the side next the sea, hollowed out by the water and polished by the rains. The seat, however, was a treacherous one. The stranger was insensibly attracted to it by the beauty of the prospect, as the Guernsey folks said. Something detained him there in spite of himself, for there is a charm in a wide view. 
the seat seemed to offer itself for his convenience it formed a sort of niche in the peaked facade of the rock to climb up to it was easy for the sea which had fashioned it out of its rocky base had also cast beneath it at convenient distances a kind of natural stairs composed of flat stones the perilous abyss is full of these snares beware therefore of its proffered aids the spot was tempting the stranger mounted and sat down there he found himself at his ease for his seat he had the granite rounded and hollowed out by the foam for supports two rocky elbows which seemed made expressly for him against his back the high vertical wall of rock which he looked up to and admired without thinking of the impossibility of scaling it nothing could be more simple than to fall into reverie in that convenient resting-place all around spread the wide sea far off the ships were seen passing to and fro it was possible to follow a sail with the eye till it sank in the horizon beyond the cascade the stranger was entranced he looked around enjoying the beauty of the scene and the light touch of wind and wave there is a sort of bat found at cayenne which has the power of fanning people to sleep in the shade with a gentle beating of its dusky wings like this strange creature the wind wanders about alternately ravaging or lulling into security so the stranger would continue contemplating the sea listening for a movement in the air and yielding himself up to dreamy indolence when the eyes are satiated with light and beauty it is a luxury to close them for a while suddenly the loiterer would arouse but it was too late the sea had crept up step by step the waters surrounded the rock the stranger had been lured on to his death a terrible rock was this in a rising sea the tide gathers at first insensibly then with violence when it touches the rocks a sudden wrath seems to possess it and it foams swimming is difficult in the breakers excellent swimmers have been lost at the horn of the bu de la rue in certain places and at certain periods the aspect of the sea is dangerous fatal as at times is the glance of a woman very old inhabitants of guernsey used to call this niche fashioned in the rock by the waves guildholm ur seat or kidamore a celtic word say some authorities which those who understand celtic cannot interpret and which all who understand french can qui dormeur he who sleeps must die such is the country folks translation the reader may choose between the translation qui dormeur and that given in eighteen nineteen i believe in the armorican by m athanas according to this learned celtic scholar guildholm ur signifies the resting place of birds there is at aurigny another seat of this kind called the monk's chair so well sculptured by the waves and with steps of rock so conveniently placed that it might be said that the sea politely sets a footstool for those who rest there in the open sea at high water the guildholm ur was no longer visible the water covered it entirely the guildholm ur was a neighbour of the bu de la rue gilliatt knew it well and often seated himself there was it his meditating place no we have already said he did not meditate but dream the sea however never entrapped him there end of chapter eight and book one reading by paul adams www.yawnguy.com